the honey was yeah i know that the honey was discovered in many cultures but you know what in ancient egypt it has a different significance or charming can we can say it's a, has a, a bit different charming because maybe it's a mixture of beliefs and and the religion and it has a lot of mystery so we will go through that tonight and we will discover it together i hope you enjoy it so first let me yeah as i told you i will go to the bees nature the honey and beekeeping before that i'd like to go to take you with me in the map of the, of egypt just um, a little a little hint about the location because I'm gonna mention the location of the bees and some of the temples in the, in the ancient Egypt. So first, in this in this uh, map, you will find the location of Egypt. Egypt is located in the northeast part of Africa, and it's it's bordered from the north with the Mediterranean Sea, East Red Sea, South. Sudan country and from the west, the Libya. And as we can see, the Nile River, which considered the longest river in the world. And I think, I believe that the length of the, of the Nile River, it's more than 4,100 miles. And the importance of the Nile River that it, it was, it provided Egypt with the fertile land and the soil, especially in the Delta. If we see here on the top, the Delta, the Delta region, the Nile, the Nile River makes made the, the Delta as a perfect environment for, for crops, for irrigation, for agric agriculture. And what I need to specify here or let you know about the location of Egypt, that the Nile River divided Egypt according to the flows. The Nile River flows from the, from the south to west. I know it's a little bit confusing because south of Egypt considered Upper Egypt. As we can see here in the on the map, Upper Egypt is the south of Egypt. And it was a land uh, considered a land of the, um, of the mummies, of the tombs of the queens and kings. And if we look, if we look at the north, this is the lower Egypt. Lower Egypt, we find in the Lower Egypt, the Sphinx, the pyramids. And the bees love to be in this part. And believe it or not, 95%, till now, 95% of the Egyptian population lives in these parts, in the Delta, because the weather, because the agriculture, fishing, everything. So now you can imagine with me, because I have a question for you guys about where's Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. The second slide with us today is about the ancient Egypt bee and its nature. Apis mellifera, or Apis mellifera, it's a Latin word, is the scientific name of, of the Egyptian honey bee. And we know that normally every species develop, develop its own characteristic features according to the surrounding environment. So we will find the honey bees or the Apis mellifera in the delta in the upper Egypt has a different characteristics when we compared with the honeybees in the in the south of Egypt or in upper Egypt. And we have also the, the Egyptian honeybees was considered smaller and more aggressive than the European honeybees. Also, they built a small colonies than the European ones. And because bees love the loved or like the the water source, they were concentrated in the lower Egypt, I mean the north, Delta region. Let's go now for the a little bit of the mystery. Egyptian bee history. Throughout the ancient Egyptian history until the Roman Empire, the bee was a favorite insect by the ancient e Egyptians. It was used like a symbol of kingship. kingship. They associated the bees with the royalty, and especially the bees. If we see here, this, if you can see, can you see this relief? This is from the city tomb from the first, from the old kingdom. I don't know if you are aware of the division of the Egyptian history. Let me give you a quick hint. 
the Egyptian history divided into three kingdoms. The first one is the old kingdom, then the middle kingdom, then the new kingdom. This relief from the old kingdom, which shows the importance of the bees from the old kingdom. And we will go through the new kingdom to, to show you. And you can see how they could uh, draw and depict the bees here. So let's go back. The bees, as, as, in, as I mentioned, it's for the, uh, king, the it's a symbol of the kingship of, kingship of the lower Egypt and appeared in the ancient texts and tombs monuments. It's also linked to several major gods and was mentioned in the pyramid texts. texts. I don't know if you know the pyramid texts. The pyramid texts were the, like a collection of prayers or spell and was, uh, was carved on the walls of the pyramids to protect the dead king or the queen. Ra, why I mentioned Ra here, Ra or Ri, some people say He's Ri, but in Egypt we call him Ra. Ra simply why I, I give this slide for Ra here, because Ra is associated with the bees. And Ra in Egyptian uh, language or uh, in the hieroglyphics means sun. And, and sun god Ra, he created himself first. He, the, he worshiped in Egypt throughout the history from the old kingdom and then through the new kingdom. So the sun god Ra, he created himself first and then created the other gods. And he has a lot of uh, titles like king of gods, father of, uh, king of gods, uh, father of the gods. And uh, according to the, so he was a main part of the Egyptian religion. And according to the Egyptian mythology, he was born every day, sailing his sunboat and then dying every night every night sailing his boat through the underworld. And um, let me give you an uh, explanation about the beliefs of the uh, Egyptian religion. It based on three concepts or three ideologies. Underworld, believe in underworld. Uh, the second one, believe in uh, it, um, afterlife and resurrection. Resurrection means rebirth of the soul. That's why they were uh, so care about the life after world. And can I can here just make small uh, zoom zoom in to show you this uh, how they depict the sun god Ra. They always depicted in many in many forms, but this the fam famous one. He was depicted with a um, human body with. Head, uh, headed falcon and the sun disk on the top of his head. And as we can see here, beside him, we will see the names of the kings and that shows the, the, the gods offering, give him the offering for the sun gods, for the sun god. And because he was so important in the Egyptian religion, some historians believe that the Egyptian Religion was based on the monotheistic one God, which is Sunra. But for me, I don't believe that. Um, I'm not with that, with this concept, because he worshiped throughout the Egyptian history, especially in the New Kingdom. It was a major, uh, it, it was a major God. But from the uh, Old Kingdom, you, we found a lot of a lot of gods in the Egyptian history. So let's go back. to the sacred bee and the myth. According to the Egyptian mythology, when, when, the, when the sun god Ra cried, his tears fell down on the, on, the, uh, on the ground and then turned on the bee and start working on the flowers and trees and then the bees and honey were created. That the, re, that the main reason why the honey bee was sacrosanct in ancient Egyptian culture. Also bees was, were considered at the gift of Ra, because he, the bees came out from his tears. And we can see here this relief, this amazing relief. I like the, all of these relief. You will find the, as I told you before, the, the bee, it represents the lower Egypt. And the other one, if we can see here, these are plants, this is a reed, 
the plan read it was a plan in Upper Egypt. This one represents Upper Egypt. And here we will see the royal name, why they merge both together, the B and, and the reed, because B represents Lower Egypt, as I told you in the, as I told you in the north, and reeds represents uh, <clears throat> the south of Egypt or Upper Egypt. And every king has five royal names. Any king of the old king, from the old kingdom to the new kingdom, has five royal names. One of them called, as I as I mentioned here, Nisud Beti. Nisud Beti, it's a title can be always comes before the coronation cartouche. The, and this is the, the, the form of the cartouche, cartouche if you can see here. And uh, here is the, the Nisud Beatty title always comes before the cartouche. And the cartouche contain the king name or the coronation name. And if we translate this, if we, if we translate the title, Literally, it's a lord of sage, which is the plant, this, this plant, and the bee. But we don't say that. The translation from the hieroglyphic and then translate to English, we will say king of upper, upper and lower Egypt. So if you see any uh, of these scenes of the hieroglyphics, you automatically know this, this title is the king of upper and lower Egypt and then the name. And this, by the way, this cartouche for Ramses II. And we have a lot of records, a lot of these reliefs and hieroglyphics. If we see this from a temple of Totmos II, if we see here, you will find the title, the Nusud Bidi title comes before the coronation, in, uh, coronation name or the cartouche. And this is another relief shows the bees the bee and then the honey jars. And the other one, which I like, I like the most, how they depict the honey in the uh, Egyptian records or the walls. So if we see this one, already we know it. This is the title of, of the king and translate as king of, uh, of uh, upper and low, of lower and upper Egypt. And the second one, if we, this is represent the seal, means sealer, the sealer of flower, flower Egypt. And if we saw in the, in the relief on, or on the hieroglyphic uh, written on the wall, if we see just the bee, it means bee. If we, if we see jar beside the bee, it means honey. If we see a man, you know, in uh, hieroglyphic, they depend, they depend on the syllables. If we see uh, a guy with the, uh, standing with a stick or, or kneeling, it means a beekeeper. And the last one, with this small head, uh, it means a chief, chief of the beekeeper of Amun. This represents Amun. And for this slide, I like this slide the most one because it's a colorful, can you see the, the, the colors here, how they, uh, how they were um, precise to draw the, you know, the small details of the bee. This is from uh, the temple of Tatmas III in Luxor. And this in the right, it's the same in the same one. It's the remains of the title of Tatmas I, of Tatmas III, I'm sorry. So in the right side, you will find this is before restoration. And on the right, on the left side, it's after restoration. And you can see here the details. It's amazing. Really, I, it's extremely amazing for me to see these colors. I've never seen this in Egypt. So, and it's back to 2012 with the Spanish expedition. Uh, they were working on the temple. And can you see this? This the remains uh, remains of the Nisud Beatty title and before the coronation name. Ancient honey. So I'm done with the bees. Now we are going to the honey. Actually, I'm not <laughs> I'm not agree with ancient honey and modern honey or new honey. Honey is honey. Honey is honey throughout the history till now. So the honey we know and love played an extraordinary role in ancient worlds, especially for the Egyptians. It was a treat for 
of all trades used for sweetening foods, healing wounds, paying taxes, and even embalming dead bodies. And the secret why, why the honey never goes bad, because the content, the content of the honey itself, it has a, a small bit of water. It doesn't have a, a big, the pH, pH of the, which is the measure of the water in the honey, it's less, it's around four or less than four, which make the environment of the honey so hard to let any micro, microorganisms like fungi or bacteria grow in, on it. That's and the acidity, the acidity of it prevents any of these my, microorganisms to live or to live or growth on this on the honey. However, honey can absorb the moisture, the moisture if we left it unsealed or uncovered. So would you like to eat a 3,000 years old honey? I'd like to listen to your answers maybe after. Would you like for me? I would I'd like because never, because honey never goes never goes bad, as we as I mentioned. As long as it's sealed correctly, you can eat uh, the honey the honey from the honey jars. And the reason for that that they discovered in the tombs, in the Egyptian tombs, a lot of honey jars with the honey and it was sealing properly. Proof of honey and beeswax usage. Honey was used as offerings to the gods in several rituals. I mean, religion rituals and was mentioned in the offering lists of festivals. Moreover, it was part of the opening of the mouth, of the mouth ritual. Opening of the mouth ritual, it was, it's, it's one of the famous religion rituals relating to the resurrection or rebirth of the soul on the afterlife. Can you connect the, connect the dots? All the, the bees and the honey, all of them related to, to the Egyptian religion at the end. So it had they mentioned the the honey as a like as like um such a like a bee bee lip balm, honey lip balm to it is to it to to get the soul to rebirth the soul again, and the bee wax the Egyptian had various uses of bees beeswax too beeswax used in cosmetics and to keep the curls for the wigs, to keep the curls uh, last too long and to keep, to keep it nice and tight. Also, they use the beeswax in the paintings and even in the some embalming practice, practices such as mummification and sealing up of the sar sarcophagus as well. And from a different pers perspective, honey was mentioned with the um, valuable items. It was like, if we mention the gold, the silver, they mention the honey. And I have, a, I have um, short videos here in this presentation for this, for the, for the doctor, for this, this is the author of the book, um, Tears of Free. And he focused in his, in his book, uh, Dr. Jean Kretzky, he focused in the beekeeping in ancient Egypt. And I can play the video now, you can listen. Oops. I'm sorry. The god Ray is the sun god. And the sun god is born every day at sunrise and dies every night essentially at sunset. And so the daily rising of the sun is like the creation story being told over again on a daily basis. There's a wonderful papyrus in the British Museum, but it dates back to 300 BCE, which reads, when the god Ray cried and his tears touched the ground, they turned into honeybees to work the fields, to work the trees, to make honey and to make wax. So the god Ray is the creator of honeybees. And that makes bees very sacred to the ancient Egyptian and honey a product of the gods. 
Well, in addition to their religious importance, uh, bees produced honey, and honey turned out to be a, a, an important commodity. We think of commodity prices today where you think about commodity futures, but it turns out the Egyptians had an economy that wasn't based on currency. It was based on equivalent values of barter and exchange. So you might be paid uh, a bag of grain for your day's work, but if the, if the person paying you didn't have the grain, he or she could pay you in a certain amount of honey that would be worth the same value. So you could be paid in honey, you could pay your taxes in honey or pay tributes in honey. Uh, so that was an important form of, of exchange. We also know that these prices changed over the dynasties. And so just like our economy changed in value of different things, so did the value of honey throughout, throughout ancient Egypt. But it was an important food stuff. It was also an important medicine. And uh, beeswax also uh, was a form of barter exchange as well. The historical evidence of the honey usage. Ancient Egyptian, now I'm gonna to focus on the historical historical evidence, something we get we got written from the ancient Egypt. Ancient Egyptian, we know that they documented day after day events using hieroglyphic language by carving on walls, symbols, stone, or papyri. But the proof of the medical usage was on a medical papyri. The Egyptian history brought us uh, more than 40 pap uh, papyrus explaining the disease recipes all concerned with the medicine. And it was written uh, with the hieratic language. We do have, we did have um, hieroglyphic, hieratic and demotic language. So for the, for these uh, medical papyri, we got, we got them in hieratic language and we were, they were written in black and red, red for the notes or for headings and black for the rest of the, for the rest of the texts. And the medical papyri described in depth diseases, diagnoses, and different rem remedies that were used to treat wounds, cuts, scrapes, and burns. And maybe, or, or definitely this is because of its antiseptic properties. And believe it or not, for me, in everyday life, in everyday uh, for the uh, kitchen accidents, when I get burned from the oven or from the hot pot, I don't use cold uh, ice or cold water, never. I just put a small layer from the honey for just a couple of uh, hours. It, for the beginning, you will feel it, it's itchy a little bit, but after a couple of hours, you, will, you won't find anything for the burn. So try it. As well as the honey, it was believed to prevent miscarriage and used for birth control, which was interesting for that. So today I picked two of uh, a couple of uh, papyrus. So Ebers papyrus, the, the name of these papyrus back to a German uh, Egyptologist, he purchased this, if we see here, this is a, this is a one page uh, from the papyrus and which, uh, it was written with a heretic language and it, it was purchased in Luxor and now it's, they kept it in the library of University of Leipzig in Germany. So honey was considered in this, in this uh, papyrus, honey was considered one of the most effective medicine for treating various eye disease. And what is surprising here with the, uh, uh, if you can see this, you will find the black, ink and the red ink. Though <clears throat> what is surprising here is that in addition to the recipe and how, it, how they use it, there is a note says with the red color says, not this well, it's really a good treatment. So it's a good point or add value to the, to the honey. And the second papyrus, this one this is also one page, it's maybe 44 pages of heretic written. It's it called Edwin Smith Papyrus. Edwin, the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus occupies the first place of remarkable list of records. It's clearly the first medical document concerned with cases of spinal cord, cord injuries. And the papyrus, papyrus here details standard Egyptian wound ointments of honey, grease, and lead. And lint. 
And what is astonishing here also in these papyrus, in these papyrus that the honey was mentioned 500 times in 900 different remedies. This is too much to, how, can you imagine how they use the honey, how they think about the honey? They, they almost use the honey in all of the diseases. And it dates to the new king, to the new kingdom. And uh, and Edwin Smith, he's an American uh, Egyptologist, purchased it in Egypt, and it's kept now in New York Historical Society. It's not in Egypt. And this is another video for the medicinal use of honey for Dr. Jean Kretzky. The Egyptians use honey in a variety of medicinal practices. Indeed, uh, there are over 500 prescriptions that use honey as one of the ingredients, in some cases to make it more palatable, but in many cases as an active ingredient. They used honey on cuts and burns because honey has such an osmotic potential that it sucks the fluid out of bacteria and lessens infections. Uh, they also uh, use beeswax in a number of, of uh, medicinal ways. In particular, you, you might go see an Egyptian physician. And in ancient Egypt, the Egyptian physicians were considered to be the best in the world. So when the Persians conquered Egypt, they wanted Egyptian physicians. And they might treat an illness by uh, giving you a, a, a potion of some kind, but also a wax amulet, for example, that you would then burn. Uh, beeswax uh, burns uh, with a very bright light, and it doesn't leave any ash. And so it's like getting rid of whatever's causing the ailment. I like his videos. I don't know, but he confirmed all, all the, I'm sorry, all the information. Yeah, let's move. We got the, the historical proof in the medical papyri, papyri, and here the historical proof on the walls. This tomb, this scene from the tomb of Mina showing this is one of the most attraction, tourist attraction in Egypt. And it's open daily, uh, every uh, daily in Egypt. And the most important thing with this, uh, with, with this tomb and the scenes, and still the, it's still kept uh, its own color. And can you see the colorful here? It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing. And one of these scenes in uh, Mina, Mina was, uh, by the way, was uh, a, like a minister or vizier minister, uh, and he was a chief of beekeeper as well. And this, and this uh, scene depicts here the honey jars. Uh, there's a, a note I forgot to mention. In the Old Kingdom, they depict, or depict the honey jars uh, with the, it, it, they were long and round, but in the New Kingdom, it, they are different. They got a diamond shape, as we can see here. And this is this con, uh, this this scene consider an offering see, uh, scene or offering table. The the guys here or the offerings bearer uh, uh, offer the offering. They are offer, offer, offering the offerings to the king. And we can see here this is the uh, the bee, uh, the honey jars. They took the diamond shape and they put them one uh, on the top. And if we can see here, there is a white line. The white line here represent the beeswax to seal the jars. And the pots underneath, we will find these uh, honey cakes. And the small, <clears throat> the small um, scene here uh, represent the um, honey beaters he, uh, holding the honey jars. And you can now know if you see any scenes for the offerings and see the shape, to, uh, the diamond shape one, you will know this for honey. And this is from mid, from old or new kingdom. This is my question for you. Try to answer it. The diamond shape honey jars from the old or new kingdom. The, let's move now to the historical to the historical uh, look at the, Egypt, the, at the beekeeping. Beekeeping has been practiced for thousands of years in Egypt, for at least 3,500 years. The Egyptians have been making hives in a 
cylinder pipe. The concept here in, for, the, for the beekeeping, they collect the mud from the upper Egypt. I mean the south, they collect the mud and form the mud in a long cylinder, long cylinder tubes and stack them on top of, of each other and make a wall and keep the bees and the coons inside it. And after that, it make uh, it, it made like a, a wall, wall of beehives. And it was easy for them to hold these walls and travel down the river or up, or up uh, to let the, uh, the bees released and work on the flowers. So they built, so it's so easy. Make uh, a, a tubes, a tubes from uh, from the mud, and they they uh, built a special rafts for moving these high hives across the Nile River. As we considered, the river was a like a, a major highway in ancient Egypt. So with the special rafts, they got these walls and then travel down the river or up to the to the delta region. This is, a, this is a lovely scene and historical evidence also shows us how they how the beekeeping in Old Kingdom. This is from the Old Kingdom and we can know this from the Old Kingdom from the shape of the honey jars. I told you it was around, long and round. So the earliest, earliest evidence of such, such practice of beekeeping in history was early as fifth dynasty from the Old Kingdom. And this, this scene was in the Sun Temple of the King, King Nusira, and now it's among the collection of Egyptian Museum in Berlin, Germany. The reef has four scenes, and I can show you in the second one exactly how they, but at, for, unfortunately, we don't have it in color, and it's damaged a little bit, as you can, not a little bit, it's damaged a lot, as you can see. So we do have four scenes, and the hieroglyphic transcriptions on the top of the scene confirmed what they are they were doing. Uh, as I mentioned in the last in the last uh, slide, you saw the hives, the wall of the hives. Oh, let's go back. So we will see the kneeling man here. He's extracting the comb from uh, from the hives, and it was and it's confirmed with the hieroglyphics here. And the second one. With, with, these, with these hieroglyphic transcriptions, it means filling. So they got the, the honey first, collect the honey, and then um, filling in two jars. And we can see this guy is pouring the honey with the, from the pot with the nozzle. This, this, this pot uh, gave us um, how they, can, they, they did that. They got the honey on the jars and put them again on the sun or the sun gods, and when when the honey in the jars warm up, the honey settle down and the bee wax go on the stay on the top. That's why this the, we see here this uh, pot has a nozzle, so they mm, like filter. They are like filter the honey into the storage jar. This this shape is uh, damaged, but it means with this remaining of the higher hieroglyphic uh, transcriptions it means like um, filter impurities or trying to to get rid of unwanted materials and the last one which means by the hieroglyphic here and the bees and the bee here meaning sealing so the guy kneeling here and sealing the sealing the honey pots so we can see here from this we can know now the importance of the honey keepings from the old kingdom and how and the, the processing uh, steps, uh, collecting, uh, filling, preserving, uh, getting rid of getting rid of uh, the impurities and then sealing the honey. This scene also one of, for beekeepers and most important from the new kingdom. How we can know this is from the new kingdom. Uh, I know we are muting the sound now. Okay, so let me give you a quick brief about this one. Uh, this scene uh, consists of two uh, parts. This is the first part. 
the the uh, the guys here they are collecting oops i'm sorry they are collecting the uh, collecting the honey the first guy holding a pot uh, with the smoke they use the smoke uh, technique smoke to calm down the the bees and then trying to extract the coons and the others they are filling the jars and the other they are sealing and on the and the bottom one, I don't have a colorful one or clear one than this, but it shows that after collecting the honey, these these are baking scene. Baking scene, they were this is the first or considered a first evidence of, of making of baking honey. They were making honey cakes or the original of honey cakes or honey loaves. And this is a video for Dr. Jean Kretzky. Kretzky confirmed these techniques. At the tomb of Rekmere, there's a wonderful scene where a beekeeper is holding a, a jar of incense and the smoke is quieting the bees. Now, whether that smoke was quieting the bees because the Egyptians thought they were giving an offering to the bees or the bees naturally, uh, detecting the smoke, we're going and filling their crops with honey to less likely sting the, the beekeepers. We don't know for sure. But smoking was a practice that the ancient Egyptians used to quiet their bees. They also extracted honey. They were able to take honeycomb, break it up, and get the honey separated from the wax so they could use it for either food or the wax for, for other purposes. So there's a number of techniques that, that uh, they are using, to, that they, are, they used in the past, that we're still using today. To show how sophisticated their beekeeping was though, they were very much in tune with the calling of the queen. And this is a practice we no longer follow in many beekeeping areas. But if you can make the right sound, a newly emerged queen will respond. And the beekeeper hearing that will manipulate the hive in different ways. And they actually moved bits of comb and started new empty colonies the same way we do today. So their beekeeping practices were much more sophisticated than we appreciated. And this, this scene is from the New Kingdom as well, from the Pavasa tomb, and shows what Dr. Jean Kretzky said about the, 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 the sound, how the beekeepers were making a sound for the, for the queen to count them, and the queen will talk back. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine how they came for this, um, for this idea. Uh, 3,000 years ago. Now we have the same, now some people do the same, but how, how they can imagine this? They are really smart. And as we know, this, this scene is the top one from the, from the tomb, and we do have uh, two parts. The first part that we will see the beekeeper pouring the honey on the jar. And if we, if we see here, I need to just zoom in this one. You can see, I don't know if you can see guys, the color, because some archaeologists came up with conclusion about, about the honey. They believe that Egyptians, ancient Egyptians have two types of honey. Two, two types, or I mean two grades, two types. The first one, it's a white honey, and they uh, collect the white honey from Delta, and it was like a pure virgin. Extra, extra pure virgin of honey, and it was used for the kings and the religion rituals. So the first one in the Delta was the white honey. And the second type of the honey was a red one, or it calls red, red honey or wild honey. And they collected from the desert, from the upper Egypt. So, and this, this uh, scene confirmed the color of the honey. Beekeepers in the society. I'm almost done, two, two slides left. So beekeepers played an important role in administration as they occupied important position in the Egyptian court and temples. They seem to have a certain hierarchy as they started as a beekeepers and then promoted to be head of the beekeepers of the Lord of, of the God. Moreover, some priests took the titles of beekeepers being the one because they were responsible, responsible for obtaining honey 
and used it in the religion, rituals, religious rituals, as I mentioned, like um, opening of the mouth ritual. And this video, it's, it's the short video is like a one minute. So we would see here, confirmation. Beekeepers were organized into a state-run system. When we think of ancient Egypt, we think of the great building projects like the pyramids and the Sphinx. But they would not have been possible if the Egyptians hadn't learned how to organize people. That's the real gift of the ancient Egyptians, a civil organization. And that civil organization extended not just to building projects, but also the beekeeping. We had beekeepers, chief beekeepers, overseer of the beekeepers, oversee the beekeepers of all the lands. Temples had beekeepers. So this whole organization of beekeeping as a state-run industry means that beekeeping was much more important than we probably thought of in our earlier history books. We know that when uh, the Egyptian empire and Egyptian civilization uh, ended around 400 uh, CE, that the beekeeping practices continued. And they continue to this very day. There's only a few thousand of the traditional hives left, but even with the introduction of modern beekeeping, the traditional methods and ways of keeping bees prevailed. And the last slide with us today is the masterpiece in Manchester Museum. Actually, it's not a masterpiece there, but for me, it's a masterpiece. Why? This object is intri intriguing object. And it's now in Manchester, Manchester Museum. It looks, at first glance, you, it looks like a thin pottery vessel open from, one, from, open from one side at the end and with a small hole at another. And guess what? What they, what they found in this uh, object, in these small objects? They found a dead bee inside and traces of pollen. Maybe it was unrecognized the function of this object, but it could be a honey, uh, it could be a honey, uh, uh, a, bee, a beehive. A beehive, I mean um, a house for the bee. So this one, it is the only one because we don't have in, uh, in any, any objects of about the honey or about the, um, the honey, uh, the beekeeping in the museums. We don't have just this one. So I consider it as a masterpiece. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, I hope it, you enjoyed it. And any questions, I'm ready for you guys. Okay, thank you, Amira. We do have My pleasure. <laughs> we have a question. So Karen would like to know, have people actually tried the ancient honey, the 3000 year old honey? When they discovered that uh, the tombs, when they discovered the, the jars on the tombs, they were sealed. So they tried it, the archaeologists tried it and they found that honey never, go, never goes bad. Okay. Uh, I would like to try it. Why not? Right? Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, I like honey. With this, uh, with this uh, presentation, every day I'm taking honey. Every <laughs> single day. <laughs> I know. I know. I want to have some now too. <laughs> <laughs> so we also had um, Malik and Louis on Zoom also mentioned that they would like to try it. Um, mm -hmm. Good. We had uh, Sarah wanted to let you know that this was a fascinating um, conversation and it was extraordinary to learn these things. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Malak. Thank you for all. And then we had Grace. I believe Grace must work in a hospital because Grace commented that they still use honey to treat wounds in a hospital today. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's fascinating that they were used 3,000 years ago. They discovered a lot of remedies, a lot of, a lot of recipes for uh, for the wound scripts, and even in the medicine, we have the honey in the medicine now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. We have three questions just popped up. So the first question is, was honey expensive? Yeah, in ancient Egypt, you mean? Yes. Yeah. It was exclusive. I, I read that, but I don't have um, a citation for that uh, part. But uh, I read that it was mentioned that it was for the nobles or the high level uh, community, uh, not for all people. 
because it was it was expensive and they uh, compared it with the with the gold and the silver as well. Okay, and Joan has a question. Why is there different grades and colors of honey? What makes those colors? The the um, they have two 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 types. The white one on the delta, because uh, as I mentioned, the um, bees has a different characteristics in the delta in the climate in the warm in the warm uh, environment in the delta in the north and they have different we have desert and wild uh, environment in the south that's why we we did have two types till now till now we have the same in egypt we have a white honey in the delta in the, in the north of egypt and the and the red one in the uh, upper of Egypt. I think uh, the beekeepers know more than me about that because it depends on the, um, the pollination and the honey and the type of flowers. So we, did, we do have uh, a lot of grades, a lot of types of the honey. That would make sense. Yeah, and according to the mountains and as well, if it's a flat ground or the mount, um, uh, mountains, you will get a... Um, a good degree of the honey if you if you get the honey from the mountains. This okay. is from my <laughs> my pers uh, my opinion. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, Rachel has a question. Rachel wants to know: Is there a reason Egyptian bees are more aggressive? Uh, you mean evidence? Yes. Uh, actually, I don't know, but I read this. But I can. Uh, these are good questions. Question. I can look for that and give you a uh, Rachel. Try to contact me. I'll try to give you the answer. Why they are more aggressive? I just maybe from the environment or the type of the Apis mellifera or the honeybee. It was it's more ag aggressive than the European uh, honeybees. Okay, uh, Suzanne would like to know where did you learn so much on this topic? From uh, my previous history, more from my previous study in the uh, Faculty of Archaeology, and um, I had a diploma, and more from the internet because we know we were not specified in these topics. We get the history in general, but uh, I'm Egyptian. I like my history. I like the ancient Egyptian history. You know, it's fascinating for anyone. Uh, mummification. If we look at the Permits, tombs, uh, yeah, I like it. <laughs> so this is my, my knowledge from all of these. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, and we have another question. You're very popular tonight. Um, why was honey used to offer to the gods? Honey was one of the same of the things, our goods, uh, which were offered to to the king, uh, to the gods, or to the queens and kings. They had a table of offerings, consist of meat, um, uh, vegetables, and all of the valuable items. So because the, the honey was a valuable item and related to the sun god um, and has um, a special uh, place, they offered them to the kings and to, to the gods. It's something like uh, when you give a present to someone, you give a valuable thing. Uh, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. I hope I can answer. <laughs> I hope this answer was helpful for you. <laughs> and we have more comments. So, um, so we have Lynn wanted to let you know that this was a very interesting uh, presentation and that she's going to try the honey on any burn she might get. Hopefully. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hopefully not anytime soon. <laughs> Um, uh, Louis had, or sorry, Louis said, uh, great presentation. Uh, glad you referenced Krinsky. I'm an amateur beekeeper and my daughter gave his book for her birthday. It's an excellent oh. read, she said. Yeah, I'm trying to get one as well. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Rachel said, thanks, Amira. This was so informative and interesting to learn from you. Appreciate how passionate you are. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. And Grace said, love you, Amira. We learned a lot. Uh, we can see your passion. Oh, thank you so much for that. Okay, we have one more question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, did they make mead? Did they make, pardon? Mead. 
mead. Mm-hmm. So like a the drink, the like a a mead is like um like an is it alcoholic drink or yeah they did honey. Have, they did, they did have, uh, yeah they did have alcoholic and um, alcoholic but uh, I, actually I don't have a lot of information about this but they did have these uh, kind of uh, drinks. Okay, I can look for it. Yeah, thank you for that. That's from Karen. So Karen will have to get in touch with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we have one more comment. Thank you. I'm a commercial beekeeper. So this is from Matt. I'm a commercial beekeeper and have always had respect for honeybees, but they now have an even more special or more special to me after this presentation. Oh, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Honey wine. Sorry, Karen, Karen corrected me. It's honey wine. I knew it was something alcoholic. <laughs> oh. The so honey wine, yes. Oh, Thank I don't Karen. know. Actually, I have to look for this information. I will send it to her. Try to contact me. Yeah. Thank you, Karen, for this note. I, I'll make a note for this. Perfect. Just... I have a question. Yep. I have a question. Do we have time? We have time. Okay. Let's get back. For the for the sun god, Ri or Ra, in Egypt we say Ra. Lots yeah. of love from Facebook for you too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can you guys tell me where is the Nisud beauty title? Ooh. I'm trying to zoom in as much as I can. I know, I know where it is. <laughs> I know, and do we have one or two or three or four for the Nasud BT? Let's see if anybody okay. writes anything. Waiting for you guys. <laughs> Everyone's, oh, can you repeat the question? Someone just asked. Can you yeah, sure. Where in this scene we can find the Nisud BT title? Okay. Do we get an, an answer? No, we're waiting. I think people are still studying the picture. Lynn wants to know uh, if, uh, where where the presentation will be available. We will have it on our um, YouTube page. Uh, it is on Facebook right now as well, but the museum's uh, YouTube page will have this recording. So you can watch it whenever you like. If you don't remember, I can tell you guys. Let's make a zoom in now again. So, if we see in the right side, this is the Nisud BT. I told you that it comes before the cartouche or the coronation name. And we did, we, the uh, Pharaohs has five royal names. One of them is a Nisud BT, which means King of Lower and Upper Egypt. We will see one on the right and the other one on the left. We did, Karen did answer. Karen said upper left, or sorry, left side, upper question mark. Yeah, good. You got yeah. it, Karen. Yay. <laughs> but we, we have two now, one on the right side and one on the left side. Uh, Peter has a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, did the pap- papyrus specify the type of honey to use in each prescription? Again, please, I'm sorry. So did the papyrus that you showed earlier, oh, yeah. uh, did it specify the type of honey to use in each prescription? Uh, maybe yes, because the, the papyrus, the one papyrus has maybe more than 44 pages. It's a lot of pages. pages. So maybe they mentioned the red, but I, I, I don't think so because this, this was an, like a conclusion from the archeologist that they have two types of uh, honey. 
but maybe I, I have to look for uh, this information, but they just mentioned the honey in a lot of recipes, a lot of, uh, and for a lot of diseases as well. But the, the type of red, uh, the wild one or the white one, I don't, I, uh, I don't have this in specific information. It's a good question though. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, it seems that all of our questions are done. Mm -hmm. Our comments are done. I'll just check Facebook really quickly. You're getting lots of clapping hands. From oh, Facebook. yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, one more comment. Love what you do, love the history. It was fascinating. Oh, thank you so much. And if you have uh, another um, topic you need me to speak about the from the ancient Egypt, I can do this for you anytime. Sounds great. Well, it sounds like everyone is really, really into this topic. Um, they really enjoyed it tonight. So uh, I'm pretty sure Amir will be back for another talk with yeah. us. So, um, <laughs> I'm glad to be back. I'm so glad. <laughs> Suzanne thanks, says, thanks so much. No problem, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is a golden opportunity for me <laughs> to join the Niagara Falls History Museum, my lovely museum, and the and Susan no. <laughs> and knows that. Oh, and uh, Louise wants to know when will the next B presentation be? <laughs> yeah, give me the topic, and I will prepare everything for you guys. <laughs> All right, so with that, I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Amira, again, for, for this amazing presentation. We all learned so much. I think we are amateur beekeepers now. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, we do look forward to another talk from you, so please stay tuned, everyone. Um, hopefully this will be, uh, probably will be uh, on Zoom because Amira is on the East Coast. Um, but um, yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Amira. Thank you for sharing with us your passion. Um, and uh, we will see you again soon. See you. Thank you okay. so much. Bye everybody. for everyone. Bye-bye.